reached the end of Esther. And I don't know about you, but at least for me, it's true what they say, that time flies when you're having fun. Um, Because I have had so much fun with this book of Esther that it feels like we really just got started. Um, The past five weeks have really just flown by as we have watched Esther grow from a silent child into a powerful leader. And today we've reached the end of our journey with her. Five weeks ago, we began by talking about how the book of Esther defies expectations, not only in how the characters refuse to conform to what's expected of them, but how the book as a whole really defies the expectations of what a book of the Bible is. It expands our understanding of the stories that we consider holy. And then we talked about getting ready for the dreams that God has for us. We talked about how getting ready is both a mental and a physical process that takes time. And from there, if you remember, we practice calling out evil by booing and hissing our way through Haman's evil plot. We watched as Mordecai's refusal to bow down to Haman revealed the hate and the cruelty that was already there in Haman's heart. And last week, we learned that answering God's call is about finding our voice becoming vulnerable, asking for help, and standing in solidarity with one another, as we saw Esther become the hero of her own story. The past four weeks, in a nutshell, if you missed any of them, there you go. But last week we ended with Esther's resolve to go before the king to plead the case of her people, even if it meant her death. We ended with those famous words of hers, if I perish, I perish. But that's not quite exactly what she did. Now, how many of you have read Esther since we started this study? Very good. Okay, a few more hands than what we started with. And if you read it, then you know that she didn't plead the case of her people right away. What did she do instead? She what? Yeah, she asked Haman and the king to come to a banquet that she was hosting. Come to a party. She knows the key to this king's heart is at the table, right? And then, at this banquet, did she plead the case of her people? No. Very good. Trick question. What did she do instead? Come back to another party, right? Yeah, she invited them back to another banquet. Now, we can only speculate about her strategy with these two banquets, but it certainly builds the the suspense of us, the audience, especially since in between these two banquets, the storyteller inserts a funny little story that is actually my favorite part of the whole book of Esther. Ahasuerus, who's completely unaware of Haman's hatred for Mordecai, asks Haman how he would honor someone important. And Haman, thinking the king is talking about him, says, well, I would put a robe on him, I would parade him through the streets, I would shout his accolades. And the king says, excellent, go do that for Mordecai. It's one of my favorite parts. It's this funny little insert. Finally, we get to this second banquet. And Esther eventually reveals the plot against her people. And when the king presses her to name the one who's done this horrible thing, who has offended the queen and brought dishonor on the house of the king, she calls out Haman. And here again, the story takes a little comedic turn. Ahasuerus is furious with Haman, so he storms off into the garden. Right? And while he's gone, Haman falls down at Esther's feet to beg for mercy. But when the king returns, 
apparently having made up his mind to do something, he sees Haman on Esther's couch and becomes so incensed because he thinks Haman is attacking the queen, making improper advances on her, if you will. And that is going too far for the king. Exterminating a whole group of people, that's fine, we'll drink to that. You fall on my wife's couch, you're going to pay. So the king orders Haman to be hung on the gallows that Haman had built for Mordecai. And talk about gallows humor. Here we have the king ordering Haman to be executed, not for the evil of his plot to exterminate the Jews, but for something he really didn't do. He was begging for mercy, not making improper advances on the queen. It's a pretty convenient misunderstanding, though, considering that Ahasuerus couldn't really punish Haman for doing something that he had permission to do. He had the king's blessing for that evil plot. But either way, Haman is gone Ahasuerus gives over Haman's house to Esther. Esther reveals her connection with Mordecai. Ahasuerus gives Mordecai the signet ring, and everybody lives happily ever after. Right? That's how it ends. Right? It would have been nice if that was the case. It would have been nice if we had ended our study here with this funny little denouement where the good guy wins, the bad guy loses, everything from the beginning has been flipped on its head and all the roles reversed. Where Mordecai gets the honor Haman desired, Haman gets the punishment intended for Mordecai, and Esther is now the one who throws the banquets instead of the king. This would have been nice if we could end it here. And some scholars think the original story really did end here, with the demise of Haman and the rise of Mordecai. They think the last few chapters were added on later to connect Esther with this celebration of Purim. And it's easy to see why they think the story ends here. It makes sense. This is a well-balanced conclusion, and it's a classic happily ever after ending. Plus, the transition from this ending to the next part is really uncharacteristically clunky for this story. So I really thought about stopping here. I really wanted to stop here. But the last few chapters aren't one of those later Greek additions that we talked about. The last few chapters are part of the oldest Hebrew manuscripts, so even if they were added later, it's only fair that we consider them as the real ending of Esther rather than stopping at the happily ever after ending. Because the problem, the problem with stopping with the happy ending is that that's the problem. It's a problem when we stop when things are happy and good for us and we ignore the suffering of our brothers and sisters. See, the happily ever after ending for Mordecai and Esther wasn't the happy ending for the Jews. Because Haman's edict was still in effect. Esther and Mordecai didn't stop with their own success. And neither should we. Earlier this week, many of you might have heard this as well, earlier this week I heard a report from the Chicago Police Department that shows a significant decrease in the number of homicides reported so far this year. In the first two months of 2019, 44 people were murdered. And this is a drastic reduction from the 80 homicides that were reported over the same period of time last year, almost 50%. And 
And while some of this decrease might be one positive aspect of the polar vortex, the CPD claims investments in new crime-fighting technology and the hiring of more officers and building better relationships are what led to this reduction in violent crimes. Now, this significant reduction in violent crime is definitely worth celebrating. But the truth is that we can't truly rejoice until there are no more lives cut short or torn apart by violence. Not just here in Chicago, but everywhere across the world. Because just because we may not be affected by violence doesn't mean that the problem is solved. Just because we have gotten used to the presence of violence in our world doesn't make it right. Just because we are enjoying happily ever after doesn't mean everyone else is. So we can't end with this happy ending of Esther and ignore all the violence that comes afterwards. We must confront it. We must let it pierce our hearts and teach us something about the world as it is and the world as we want it to be. So in order to neutralize the violence of Haman's edict, Esther and Mordecai did something very similar to what we might do today. They wrote another law. It was just a whole lot easier to get laws passed back then as long as you had the king's ring. So Esther and Mordecai write this new law. They distribute it in the name of the king, and it gives the Jews the right to defend themselves on the day when Haman would have had them destroyed. And this is the way our world works, or doesn't work as the case may be. We get caught up in this seemingly endless cycle of proposing and passing and reviewing and changing our laws, hoping and praying that the process will bring us ever closer to being a land of peace and prosperity for all. And it's true that some laws are better than others, just like we see in the book of Esther. But it depends on the agendas of those doing the proposing and the passing and the reviewing. But but the real truth is that no matter how careful we are, no matter how well-intentioned we are, or how carefully we craft those laws, there will always be cracks in them. There will always be loopholes for people to exploit cracks for people to fall through. So maybe the Jewish people took advantage of Mordecai's decree and used it to get even with their persecutors. So the storyteller is very clear that they did not take any plunder. But what if we read this ending as something that didn't actually happen? Just as there's no record of Queen Esther or King Ahasuerus, there aren't any reports of a Jewish uprising that fit this description. So one might argue that this is just the imagined justice of an oppressed people. The daydreams of an occupied people about what they would do to their tormentors if they had the chance. Today's, the title of today's message was a question. Wondering if Esther was asking Asking for this extra day of fighting that we read about was asking for too much. Now, I don't have a good answer for this question. I really tried. Sorry. And maybe it's taking the easy way out, but the reason that makes the most sense to me is that the point of this extra ending was to connect Esther to the celebration of Purim. So in order to explain why Purim is a two-day celebration... They had Esther ask for an extra day of defensive measures for her people. That's the best I have. Sorry. But I have something maybe a little better. Because as I was thinking about this question of asking too much, I am still intrigued by it. 
and for what it means about the kind of world that we live in and the kind of people that we are called to be. I'm curious if we ask too much of our laws and those in power to be the agents of change in our society instead of ourselves being that change that we want to see in the world. I'm curious if it's too much to ask for the world to be at peace for swords to be beaten into plowshares and for lions to lay down with lambs. Is that asking too much? Is it asking too much for no one to go hungry or to be displaced because of war? What does it mean to ask too much? One of the lessons that we learn from Esther is that who knows? that maybe we are each uniquely situated in this world for such a time as this. Opportunities abound for us to bring the world to a more peaceable and loving place. It is not asking too much for these things to come about. As followers of Jesus and people of faith, we bear the heart of God's peaceable kingdom into the world. So it seems fitting that the last lesson that Esther has to teach us is one about endings. That if we don't like how a story is going, we have the power to change it. Esther shows us that we all have a story that we are called to be the hero of. God may ask a lot of us, but God never asks too much. So as we bring our time with Esther to a close, receive these blessings. May the spirit of Vashti empower you to defy expectations. May the courage of Mordecai embolden you to call out evil. May the resolve of Esther encourage you to answer the call of God. And may God bless your questions, even as you live out the answers. Amen.